Your Action Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics. Well, we'll be talking politics and public policy because we are blessed to have as our guest, Keith Koneman. He is the man. He is Daly's biographer, okay? What did he say? Who said Daly's like stone? What's that guy you know, in history? I can't remember. Anyway, and he is the guy. If you want to know what's happening in Chicago, okay? If you want to know, okay, over the last 58 years, we have had a daily in the mayor's chair for 43 of those that's 58 right, that's years, right. right? That's exactly right. It's pretty amazing. And you, it's as if, I mean, you didn't speak with Mayor Daly. You gave him the opportunity, and of course the other Mayor Daly, as some would say the real Mayor Daly, Richard J. Daly, he's deceased, okay? Right. But you spoke with 140 or so people, right? right? Okay. spoke with a lot of people. A lot of folks, and they were close to these guys. Yeah, all, all of them uh, okay. knew the mayor well, either personally or okay. professionally. So if I said to you, if I said, Keith Koneman, tell me, what's the legacy of the other guy, the real Mayor Daly? The first Mayor Daly. The first Mayor Daly, really? Richard J. Daly. I know right. you didn't write the book about right. that, but you know, what's his legacy? And as you point out, you, they'll probably get one line in history, right? Right. One line, that's all you get. That's right. what Sabato said, right. he's quoting somebody else. What's the one line about that everybody in the city of Chicago watching this should know about Mayor Richard J. Daley? Well, well the, the first Mayor Daley is sort of the last of the big city bosses, you know, sort of a, almost a bygone era. Um, my, my book uh, on his son, the second Mayor Daley, actually starts in 1902 with the birth of the father and goes through 2011. So it covers uh, uh, more than 100 years of sort of daily family history in Say Chicago. Say again, your book starts with? It starts in 1902 02. with the birth, birth of, of the Dick Daley, the father, and, and finishes in 2011. So it covers 100 years of Chicago history and daily so history. So we got the father, right. and we got the son, right. we got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> There's no Holy Ghost to this Trinity. Uh, the, the Holy Ghost, maybe that's uh, sort of sort of the politics and the machine. It's, it's, okay. it's hard to say. So it starts at 1902. You go to the current 2011. Yeah. We're taping this show, and we're taping this show uh, April 28th, 20, 2013. That's right. Okay. So you went through 2011. That's when you finished writing this book. That's when the book uh, stops. So it's just, it, it ends in November of 2011. Okay. And with regard to the first mayor, Daly, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, he, he was the first mayor in 1955. And in my opinion, the first mayor, Daly, had two really excellent terms between 1955 and 1963. He really brought a lot of um, leadership and vigor and building to the city. Uh, and of his 21 years, those were the key period in your view. Well, that, that was his best, best run. His best shot. Yeah. And then between. So what's the legacy? We'll come back to all this stuff. Yeah. What's the legacy for Richard J. Daley? One line. Um, incredibly talented uh, politician who was also deeply flawed. Okay. Skip right ahead and we'll come back. Yeah. What's the legacy for Mayor Richard M. Daley? Well, this is my opinion. I, I know it's still fresh, so some people might have different views, but I, I think the Suns could be remembered for uh, the transformation of Chicago into a global city. And I also think he's going to be remembered for sort of finishing the unfinished business of the Daly family in some ways. Um, so some of the uh, things that his father did not do, the son tried to, to do. So he tried to fix the schools, he tried to fix public housing, and he really improved race relations. Richard M. Daly. Did Richard that. M. Daly. Richard J., he didn't fiddle around with the schools. He didn't. They were actually maybe good enough then. In those days, the schools, public schools were pretty good, right? Well, well, they still had some challenges. They had some challenges, yeah. but from 1955 to 1976, when Mayor Richard J. Daley was there, Chicago Public Schools, there are a lot of people we know. Yeah, they, they're, they're they said they went there and they did fine. Right. And they weren't just a bunch of, well, there were some who were white, there were some who were black. There were probably many more whites in the population of the city of Chicago during that period mm -hmm. than recently, right? Well, there's been it, a lot of white flight out of the city. Yeah, right? but uh, the, the great. Uh, uh, migration of, of African Americans to the north actually occurred during the first Mayor Daley's time in power. So between... So he had a lot of blacks coming in when he was mayor from the south. Right, from the south of, okay. of, of the United States. So right. when he, in the 40s, Chicago had about 5% uh, uh, black population. By 1960, it had a third. So uh, between World War II and 1960, uh, the, the, the racial mix of Chicago changed a lot. It and changed to being about a third black About city? being a third black. And at that time, what what year was that in parent? What, 63, did you say? Or uh, for, from about this, uh, World War II until about 1960, there was this great migration. So by 1960, a third of Chicago was African American yes, that's or right. black. And how many of those people, when they were voting for mayor, were voting for Richard J. Daley? Well, did he have a strong 
pull for them or not? He 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 actually got a high percentage of, of the of the black vote um, through other blacks who would go out and get the black vote for him. What was the name? Was somebody named Dawson? Was yeah, Dawson was yeah. a very uh, strong uh, sort of black political boss, and 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 uh, the first mayor Daley ceded a lot of. Uh, sort of the south side of the city to him. So he, they, they used to call him a sub-boss. So he, Dawson would run uh, those black neighborhoods and bring in uh, very large vote totals uh, for himself and for Mayor Daley. So that was the old machine. Right. That was the Mayor Daley machine, and there was a black component to that machine, mm -hmm. right? And blacks would go out, and they'd work their wards, and they'd bring in those black votes, and they'd get their reward. They'd That's get right. their patronage, right? Yeah, they got a lot of patronage jobs, right? And that was the way politics worked. Right. Okay. And then, jumping ahead, come back, 1976, Mayor Daley dies. Right, right, the first Mayor Daley. Heart attack, he's, he's going to leave office the only way he knew how, feet first. Right, right. right. And then you have 13 years of city council wars, right? Mm -hmm. Lots chaos. of instability, chaos. Uh, what was it? The city. What, what was it? What's uh, the, the uh, Beirut? reputation? Beirut by the lake and uh, the council wars. You had five mayors between 1976 and, and 1989. You had five superintendents of the schools, and you had uh, racial instability. It was really uh, a very um, and, and there was also the deindustrialization uh, of the Midwest. So you know the Rust Belt. So it was really a hard time uh, during that 13-year uh, period. So really, the city could go a variety of ways then. You would say ultimately the city became a major global city, right? Uh, if you fast Chicago. forward to, to, to the All present way, time. Right, to the present. Yeah. And you'd give, you say that might be Daly's legacy. Right. The second mayor, Daly. The second right? mayor, Daly, yeah. That he, he oversaw that, and in some sense you may say he, he caused that. Well, he, I wouldn't say he, he caused it because it's not one man who deserves yeah. the, all the credit blame, but he was a leader, and I think in order to be a global city, you have to be both pro business and pro culture. And, um, and you have to have a long period of stability so that people like business people and politicians, can, it's hard to make uh, investments in the future and take risks for the future in an unstable environment. In a stable environment, people are willing to do that. And uh, so I think the second mayor Daley uh, was both pro-business and bro both pro-culture. And Chicago evolved uh, over a couple decades and, and to much more of a global city. But taking a step back, I mean, okay, here are the people who say, you know, Mayor Richard M. Daley, when before he was mayor, mm -hmm. okay, there was no great flash to this guy. That's right. We talk about this growing up, there was no great flash to him going to high school or school. He went to parochial schools, right? Uh, he went to all the same schools his father he went to, uh, the same uh, grade school, Catholic grade school. He went to De La Salle, which is a Catholic high school. He went to DePaul, which is a Catholic university. So he went to all the same Where did he go to law school? DePaul. And then he took the bar, right? He took, did. I mean, he, he took the exam. He, did, he didn't pass right away, did he? It, it, it took three, three, tri times, three, three tries. Three tries. So, you know, people out there would know, if you go to the University of Chicago Law School, just to pick one, or sure. Northwestern, sure. probably you get like an 85, 90% pass rate. Those are national law schools. They don't drill you the local stuff. Mm -hmm. The state bar is the local stuff. But they're smart people. Yeah. And so the thinking is they don't have to teach them. They take this mini review course. These sort of people coming out of Northwestern yeah. cram a little bit and they pass. They yeah. get 85, 90 yeah. percent pass rate. You don't find that at DePaul, okay? Uh -huh. And Daly failed the first two times. Good. But you know what? I mean, you tell me. People say failure's not so bad. In fact, it's good. It, it can build it, character. I, I think yeah. it's one of the interesting things about the story, if you read the book, is is he really evolved tremendously as a person and as a professional. So he was this average kid. He liked to play base, basketball with his buddies. He wasn't a great student, uh, had some trouble with the bar. Um, and then after his father died in 1976, there's another great story, is that the, 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 the Democratic machine, the Daily machine, actually tried to kill off Rich Daly politically. So in 1980... Why would they do that? Uh, well, maybe when you say the Democratic machine, who was that? Well, so Jane Byrne was the sitting mayor of Chicago. Okay. Uh, Fast Eddie Vidolia controlled the, the Democratic Party. He was the chairman of the Cook County De Democratic Party. Uh, Ed Burke uh, was a sort of well-known uh, uh, person in the alderman and the city council. Ed Burke ran against Rich Daley uh, for state's attorney in forty-eight. And when was that? In 1980. And 48 of the ward committeemen backed Ed Burke. Only yeah. two. Uh, backed uh, Rich Daly. So he was really sort of on his own with a machine against him, with a machine against a Daly. And uh, he, he won in a year, which you probably remember, Jeff, was the Reagan Revolution. It was a yes. very unusual year for a Democrat to win. Rich Daly won. And so he bucked the tie, the Republican tie that swept the country. Swept, the country swept Illinois, swept everywhere. Richard M. Daly bucked that tide. 
he got elected and got elected as a Democrat. A Democrat without the machine. So he did it on his own. And so that's the beginning of it. But there is a magic to the daily name. And there was then. And he had a lot of support. Maybe he didn't have all those committee men you mentioned there, those ward guys, okay? But he did have people. I mean, you know, when he when he was when he was state's attorney, Mm -hmm. who was his first assistant? Wasn't it Dick Devine? Dick Devine, that's right. You know, and so Devine liked him. Right. And Devine was a power and became a power unto his own. Devine shocked everybody and won the state's attorney the state's attorney's office himself right. in, when was it? Can't remember now. After Daly retired. Like yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So he, so he won that, he won that. So he had people like Devine, he had people like Julie Hamos who helped make Barack Obama right. president of the United States, a whole other story. He had some, uh, he some had political a lot of people, operatives, Tim Degnan, Jeremiah Joyce. Which right. is pretty, those guys are not those just guys some, are smart. not just some political Tough. operatives. Tim Degnan and Jeremiah Joyce, those guys know what's ha- going on, yeah. they know how to spread around patronage, they know something about pinstripe patronage, mm-hmm. they know how to get things done. And he had those guys. Right. And he had them because his name was Daly. And maybe they liked him, and maybe he was one of the guys. But the point is he had a few things going for him in addition to the fact that when he failed, Daly dusted himself off, got up, and you sort of and came back. Yeah, I think it's really impressive. I think it's yeah. really impressive. And, and that he also, as he uh, matured in office as state's attorney, started um, getting new advisors. Some of his advisors um, uh, had uh, been against him earlier in his career. So Don Clark Netsch, for example, did not like Rich Daly when they were What did she call him? Well, back in uh, the early days uh, of when he was in the Illinois Senate, she called him Dirty Little Richie. Yeah, but not, then, not a very flattering term. That's a tough nickname. That is a tough one. But then when he was a state's attorney, she campaigned for him on the lakefront. She can't campaign for him in the gay community. And she worked with him on some important legislation, like mental health legislation and so forth. So uh, there was also a fellow by the name of John Schmidt, who was a very well-respected right. uh, lawyer. Uh, who, Mayor Brown and Platt. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very now well, it's Mayor Brown. But very well-respected guy. Um, uh, very, the, very progressive. Very known progressive. In, in the liberal community. Right. And so at this point, Daly was becoming a progressive, a liberal. He wasn't. His dad certainly wasn't, was he? Oh, his dad was not. His, his dad, well, th- there's an evolution there as well. But by the time, um, uh, the, the first mayor, Daly, interesting, started as a, a FDR Democrat way, way back in the right. 30s. But by the time he became powerful and became sort of the, the mayor Daly that we know, he had become much more reactionary. And yes, he epitomized the establishment. I mean, he helped JFK get elected in right. 1960. Yeah, but by 1972, the Democratic Party turned on Richard J. Daly basically took away his credentials. We have those famous scenes with him swearing at Senator Ribicoff at the convention. People were calling these Chicago police riots. All of that was Mayor Daley. No, no, he was not known as the progressive, right? Oh, no, at that stage of his career, he was known as the the, the big city boss. And and his son was close to him. As you point out, his son was tracking him until the day Mayor Richard J. Daley died. Mm -hmm. Then, as you point out in your book, here's the book, First Son, the biography, the biography of Richard M. Daly, okay? You wonder, it's a good read. It's a long read, but it's a very well-researched book. It's the University of Chicago Press. This, uh, we were talking before the show, this should be a textbook. People should be teaching this course. Chicago politics for mm-hmm. that century, from 19, more than a century, from 1902 to 2011. Lots of footnotes, there's research, uh, I don't know. There might not be that many opinions here. There's a lot of facts. Yeah, what I I'm squeezing out some opinions here. Right. But these people should know this about Keith. Yeah, this is important. Keith, Keith didn't run around just giving opinions. I'm trying to squeeze them yeah, out. Yeah, right. But this, this is not a book of opinions. The book I try and be very balanced. I try to make it a really interesting read, an uh, interesting life story. But I try to be very balanced about the man's uh, accomplishments okay. and mistakes, his strengths and his weaknesses. All right. So. So we have this guy daily. He's starting to become his own man. His father dies. He's now in 1976. Where is he? He's in the state senate. He's in the Illinois State Senate. He's um, is, he, is he like a big guy? He's not the Senate president, is he? No, he's uh, 34 he's, years old. He's on a, a couple committees, and he's just right. a regular sort of Illinois State Senator. Obviously, he had some stature because his father was powerful, but he's a sort of a regular Illinois State Senator. Okay, and I mean he's had some experiences with his father. He had that bill you describe in the book where it was to, he thought to help artists, may give them a fair shake, right. but he forgot to check with some important people. Right. First, he forgot to check with his dad, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> a funny story, a, yeah. Right. So yeah, he, he, he uh, tried to get a bill passed that would uh, sort of uh, help artists uh, maintain some equity, so if their paintings or their works of art would sold, they could get some money later on. Sounds fair. 
Uh, it, it sounds like... Uh, help the artists. They're part of the progressive liberal Very progressive. Right? Uh, and uh, it turns out um, there's a lot of art collectors and business people and museums and so forth that were threatened by that bill. And they put in phone calls to, uh, to his father, the first Mayor Daley. The real Mayor Daley. The, 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 the first one, uh, yeah. who told his son, hey, you can't, you can't back this bill on my watch. Maybe someday when you're your own man, you can do it. But the right, as he went down there and discovered suddenly he had no co-sponsors. All right? his co-sponsors so evaporated. So it wasn't going to get hurt. So nothing happened. Dude, and Richard M. Daly never made that mistake again. Not while his father was right. alive. He didn't cross his father. Right. Okay. He was very respectful of his and father. And he learned from his father that you want to check with these people. Right. Maybe you want to pass that legislation, but you don't want them reading about it. You want to call them. You want to persuade them. You want to control. You would have thought he would have known that from hanging around with his dad, right? right? It's interesting. Um, he, uh, given that, like, 20 years later, uh, uh, Rich Daly, the, the second mayor of Daly, was known for supporting culture and known for supporting arts, it is interesting to me that he uh, he had this inclination to try and help artists because later when he was mayor, uh, he, he, he backed a lot of culture in the well, city. Was he married then? I mean, was Maggie Daly his wife when he was 34? Maybe she was already having an influence. I, on I have to think? check. It's, it's right about around yeah, the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, women can be fairly influential of their husband's spouses. Yeah, yeah right. and, and Maggie was uh, passionate about culture right. and the arts, and I think she r rubbed off on him. In Wasn't positive she way. why he one day come back to this? Maybe go right to it now. Mixfield. What do you do at Mixfield? So Mixfield, uh, uh, he had the the runway sort of ripped up in the middle of the night uh, after midnight. Um, because he didn't want to wait. If he if he were to if he were to do something, state that Mixfield was no longer going to be used for these private jets. Because what really was drive? What was the driving force about Mixfield? Why was he even doing that? Well, I've gotten different stories. Some people say that um, that uh, they just didn't like that. Their, their, their house was actually very close to Mexico. What was his wife trying to do with that? Wasn't she trying to put a campus there, a museum campus? She visualized this whole mix field not as a place for planes to come, right. but she views it as it was a museum campus. For like a park Parks, and, right. and beauty. And Don't you think that was? I mean, I, I've never thought there was a too much dispute. She wanted to change that nature. I mean, she, wanted, she thought that was an integral part of the evolving new city, Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, he was influenced by his wife. He didn't want this to go on and on. You know, if you just said, okay, we're going to do this, Maggie, we'll change it, somebody will file a lawsuit. There would have been be a lot of court. lawsuits, yeah. It'll be make it make it a, a, a fait accompli, right? Yeah, I think I think so. He's probably frustrated with the slowness of the process. I, so, I, what is, so, he, so he destroys the field. People can't, they complain. They say this is idiotic. This is, you know, this is the way, not the way you do things. But at the end of the day, I know you're somewhat critical, and you say this would, might have been a mistake on his part. I think it was a big uh, violation of the democratic process. I actually don't have a, a problem okay. with the, like putting a park there or whatever. Uh, but, but, but it worked. It, give it to this. Did it work? Did he get what he wanted? And although it was that violation, he didn't do it again. He didn't violate due process. Nothing terrible happened. And he got it done and got it done quickly. Would you give him that? I, I, I wouldn't. No, was, my, my no. problem. We, we, we are. Yeah, we. The, the, America is the greatest uh, democracy in the history of human civilization, and 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 we are a country of laws and not of men, and and and, uh, and doing things yeah. the right way is more important than the result. So let's go back. Seventy six. He's a state senator. His father's dead. He goes ahead. He he forms his team. He gets new advisors. He becomes state's attorney in nineteen eighty one. Right. That's right. He runs for mayor in 83. You say in your book that was a mistake. He didn't get a sense of what he was up against, what he had to do. Well, first of all, Harold Washington was a, a, a very talented politician. Right. He underestimated uh, Harold. He underestimated Harold. He thought it was going to be him against Jane Byrne. Jane Byrne, by the way, is, you know, we all have our flaws. Jane Byrne had her flaws, but she was not a bad politician either. So he ran against two pretty good politicians, particularly Harold. He also, you know, didn't wait his turn. Oh, by the way, when his father was in charge of de the Democratic machine in Chicago, you had to wait your turn. And running against a sitting mayor, Jane Byrne, whether you like her or not, was the sitting mayor. And he, and he didn't he didn't raise enough money. Right. right. He didn't raise enough money. That's right. And like Barack Obama, when he ran, Obama ran against Bobby Rush, came here and he told me, mm -hmm. he said he made two mistakes then. He listened to people who said they were going to back him and he didn't get the money up front. <laughs> and he didn't get the, enough money and he didn't start soon enough. Right. And he didn't make that mistake again because he started running for the U.S. Senate basically on this show in November or before of 2002 for a primary in 2004. My point is Daley made that mistake. He didn't raise enough money. Mm -hmm. Maybe he started running then for mayor for 1989. 
okay, yeah. when he lost in 83. Yeah. He certainly raised a lot of money when it came to raising money in 89. In 89, right? he had a, a well-oiled uh, political and machine. And the business culture, the business community, the establishment was all pretty much behind yeah, him. Yeah, they lined right? up behind him. All the papers yeah. endorsed him. Right. He raised uh, $7 million very quickly. A, a guy by the name of Rahm Emanuel helped him raise that money in 1989. The people who were in the Civic Committee, the people who were in the Civic Federation, I don't know whether, they're, they're not partisan, so they may not have formally come out for him, mm. but many of the people who formed the nucleus, the pillars of the business establishment, yeah. they were there for Ritchie, right? Very much so. In because they understood business needed more certainty, business needed stability, and this city didn't have any of that when you had to he had these other folks running things from 76 to It was chaos. It was yeah. chaos. Yeah. And right. so a lot of people wanted stability and they thought uh, okay. uh, Rich Daly could provide it. And is that, was that one of his major accomplishments that, that Rich Daly brought to the scene from 89 to 2011? It really is tremendous. Uh, it's a big deal, the stability. I think it's easy Political to, stability. Political stability and economic stability. Which brings economic stability. Yeah. What allows uh, business people to make decisions because they know that uh, that the people who agree to them are going to be there uh, uh, two years later or five years later. And he brought the O'Hare Midway expansion. That's very important. Right. So uh, we talked about the globalization of Chicago being an accomplishment. Well, the, the, the economy in the Chicago area is uh, uh, about $460 billion. It's a huge number. You can't have an economy that big without having some really big, important airports like uh, O'Hare and Midway. And Daly, to his, very much to his credit, uh, backed the expansion of O'Hare and the expansion of Midway. A tremendous expansion of Midway. Yeah. Some of us remember it was almost not an airport for a it while. Was it used to be tiny. That's right. Yeah. And now it's really a major, it's a major airport. Yeah. It's, it's, it it's doesn't compete with O'Hare, but it certainly supplements O'Hare. Right. And O'Hare is ground. Okay, so he did that. And then he started Chicago education reform, right? Mm -hmm. In 1995, yes, he was the first big city mayor in the country uh, to uh, take responsibility for schools. At the time, it was considered very politically risky. A lot of his advisors advised him not to do it, uh, and, and yet he took over the schools. And he took over, and he was given that by the Republicans in this period, this unusual period where the Republicans had the majority yeah, it's funny. in both the State yeah. House and the State Senate. They had the State Senate for a long time, yeah. but the State House, they only had for two years. During those two years, they had the authority, the Republicans, to give the power to Daley they, they gave him the school board. That is, the Chicago school board had been elected previously. Right. They said it's now going to be appointed by the mayor, right? That's right. Now, some people want to undo that now, currently. Some people want to go back to an elected board. So he had the power, and as you were saying, some people advised him not to take this. He would be blamed if it fell. They thought it would fail. Right. But you would say, to his credit, he did embrace that. Yeah, I, I think he embraced it. And I think one of the things leaders do is whether they're leading a city or an organization is they try and get uh, people to focus on things really important. So I think uh, by uh, daily uh, uh, taking over the schools, he was saying to the city, this is really important and we should all focus on it. So that's an important act of leadership, I believe. He started low income housing reform. He started, what did they call it, the transformation? Plan for transformation, which is also uh, a, a, a big uh, political risk. Destroyed, the, destroyed these awful complexes that his father had put up, concentrated poverty yeah. and crime and these high rises which were just Yeah, the public high rises were problems. just horrible, yeah. He said now we're going to have mixed income housing. Right. It's not going to be just low income, there will be middle income, it's going to take a while. It ruffled a lot of feathers, there are a lot of people who are upset. Mm -hmm. But most would say he started that reform. Whether he, whether it's working out is another matter. Right. He improved price relations immeasurably. Yeah, right? absolutely, there's no question, which, okay. is, which is tremendous. I mean, it used to be uh, a, a tough place for uh, minorities to live. Chicago today has some very successful African-American um, uh, and Hispanic business people, uh, politicians, obviously, and entertainers. Chicago is a great place uh, to, to be a minority. But on the other hand, you say in their book there's some mistakes. I'm going to call them on this show. My fault. I'm calling them failures. You say mistakes. I would call them mistakes, but yeah. Okay. Whatever. No. They were negatives. No. We've just discussed some of the positives. In my view, mm -hmm. not yours necessarily, but you would agree, no radical improvement in education during would, his period, right? I would agree. Well, it's, it's had some ups and downs. Actually, during the Vallis years from 1995 for six or seven years, there were actually some uh, a huge building of, of, of new schools, which, is, which was good. And uh, for grade school kids, for younger kids, uh, like kindergarten through fifth grade kids, they had some really nice improvement. It's, so, so it seemed. So it seemed. Yeah. But then Vallis and Chico uh, sort of left, and then... Um, 
over the 22-year period, even though we've had some ups and downs, it hasn't been that much of improvement. Right, and no radical improvement in the low-income housing. Maybe things are getting better, but you still got a lot of problems. Yeah. So, but the, well, the one thing I would say about the, the schools first and the housing second um, is these are really difficult problems. You know, a lot of it's socioeconomic in nature. So 85% of uh, kids in pu public schools are uh, living below the poverty line. 85% are minorities. A lot of them come from single parent families. If you're the mayor, you can't like make a, a single parent family become a, a, you know, a, a two parent family. So there's a lot of tough stuff well, there. Yeah, yeah, we were talking before the right, show. Right. In your opinion, maybe it's not in the book, but yeah. your opinion, what could somebody do to radically improve education? Yeah, if, if, if you were going to really take a radical improvement, um, school choice, I, I personally believe, makes sense. I think you have to. Um, and by school choice, you mean? Uh, allow, um, uh, you know, whether it's a voucher or some mechanism like that, allow kids and their parents to sort of vote, uh, go to the school where they think they're going to get the better education, and over time then the really good schools would sort of uh, fl flourish. So there'd be competition, Cop some of those good, those good schools would attract more customers, the bad schools wouldn't. Charter schools, we could have many more. Right now we only have about oh, 10 to 12 percent of the kids in, the ch in Chicago public schools are in charters. Right. The rest are in traditional public right. schools. We don't have school vouchers, which Milton Friedman would say is complete choice. So admittedly, I, I think the it's, admittedly it's difficult, but I'll just say, as a very quick aside, I saw Mayor Daly once speak at the City Club, and he spoke about charter schools. I said, why not vouchers? He said, oh, that'll never happen. It's too difficult. He couldn't even accomplish it. You couldn't get the legislature to do it. It would be all tied up in court. The only criticism, you know, and if the mayor were here, we'd say this. Maybe you should have given him a shot. We, we're going we're gonna to continue to speak as the credits roll. I'm so sorry. We only have a few more minutes. But very quickly, yeah. if Mayor Daley what, were here, and he read the book, what do you think he'd say? Do you think he'd say you got it right? I think he, uh, well, it's a good question of what he'd say, but I think it's a very high quality book, and I think he would recognize that. Um, you know, it's, it's well researched, it's well written, and I think he would recognize the, the high quality nature. What do you think his, he would say his legacy is? Uh, he would say he was a public servant, uh, you know, someone who really just worked hard for the people over many decades. And we skipped over continued public corruption, immense continued public corruption. His chief patronage guy took a hit four years in prison, never flipped on Daly. Mm. Hard to believe that Daly didn't know about that patronage corruption going on, right? Well, I don't know for sure. I mean, he had a reputation as being a very hands-on mayor, right. which is hard to square that with, you know, not knowing a bunch of things were going on. But, you know, um, it's hard to say. I don't know. Well, do you give him a pass? Does that obliterate all these things that we talked about that were positives? This continued public corruption. You know, I don't know how many people Patrick Fitzgerald put away from the daily machine, the yeah. daily administration. Didn't put away everybody, but quite a few. Don Tomzak. Some would say Rahm Emanuel got elected by the Tomzak army, right? And, and Rahm would say he didn't know anything about that. Okay. We skipped over that. Key advisors, Rahm Emanuel, Forrest Claypool, okay, right? David Axelrod. David Axelrod. Right. Those were the new people that made That he Mayor brought Daly, them in, in 1989. Right? He were very helpful. Them. They were very helpful. Extremely, right? They were very smart guys, uh, uh, pro more progressive on social issues, uh, uh, very hardworking, and uh, I, I think they helped him a lot. All right, so here's the book. First Son, the biography of Richard M. Daly. Keith Koneman, you want to take a quick read of that? You're going to quickly just rattle off some events coming up. Tuesday, May 14th, the bookstall in Winneka, 7 o'clock, you're going to be there, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Tuesday, May 21st, lunch at the Union League Club, right. right, downtown at noon, right? Mm -hmm. And then Thursday, out in New York, 92nd Street, why? Yeah, the, in Tribeca in New York okay. on the 23rd of May. And then back here at Niles Public Library on Wednesday, May 29th. That's right, right. it'd be great to see people. So you're getting around, you'll want to speak with Keith, and he's a very, he's a very approachable, okay? You're just a regular guy. Right? Thanks so much for having me. Okay, thanks so much for coming. All right. What did we what did we miss? What would you have liked to say?